Have a seat. Uh, let's thank the band. They did an awesome job this morning. Well done, guys. Still getting used to my Manu shades. I've been told uh, once, you, once you hear it, you can't really unsee it. Look like Harry Hill from TV Burp, the bald guy with the, the big rims. How are you all doing this morning? You seem a bit tense. It's okay. It's, it's going to be fine. What's that? It's a glass. It's unrecognizable. It's like when Clark Kent has the glasses. You'd never know it was Superman. <laughs> anyway, let's get to it. Um, I'm sure the majority of you have seen Mary Poppins. Iconic. It's a, a classic movie. And there's always the scene in the bank um, when, when the dad... He brings a little boy in to invest his tuppence uh, for the first time. You probably remember the scene, right? Uh, he brings him along, this, the, the two kids as well. And the little boy, he just wants to invest his tuppence into, into flying a kite, is it? Or he wants to give it to... Feed the birds! That's it. Flying the kite comes later. But he just wants to feed the birds. He's a free spirit, this kid. But the dad is insistent on him uh, investing this tuppence into the bank. And I always remember this scene... It stressed me out uh, so much. I think, I don't know, the, the coloring of the building, it's this marble, big, kind of daunting building that they're brought into. It's dark, it's not bright. Everyone in there is all stuffy, and they're doing this weird dance routine, and I just never understood it. And it's the ma majority of them are these old, grumpy, very stern uh, men. And they're very insistent on him um, giving his tuppence away. <laughs> Nothing personal. And... <laughs> We're all getting that way. Um, and, and I would see similarities of, of that with, you know, you go around art galleries and you'd see what pictures of God would look like. And it'd always be this old guy with a, a big gray beard and he'd kind of look very similar to these horrible old men in the, um, in the bank. And I suppose that was my original uh, interpretation of what God must be like. This stuffy old man who was going to steal my money and stop me from flying my kite. Uh, <laughs> It's not the case now, but this is a, we're going somewhere with this, don't worry. We can end up basing our idea or our perception of God on the people around us or the authority figures that we grew up with. For me, my first, um, first idea of God was this. Um, and if these experiences we have of these authority figures that we've had early on in life are negative, it can have a very negative effect on how we view God and how we view his nature compared to you know, how we think, um, how, these, how these people have treated us, how we've seen them, we think that's how a God must be as well. Um, and with some people uh, like that, you really only have one chance to impress them, it can feel like. Uh, you have really one chance to gain their trust or gain their love, and if you blow it, so to speak, then there's no other chance of attaining their trust or attaining their love whatsoever. And... You know, we can, we can hear about God's amazing love for us and God's amazing grace for us, and it can be very difficult to internalize. It's very easy to intellectualize. You can hear it in your head and say, oh, that sounds great, but it can be very difficult to, to really feel this, really experience it if we haven't properly experienced it on a human level before. If, you know, if someone's grown up without this sort of love, without this sort of affirmation, we can think it's, it's very hard to imagine how someone could really feel that towards us. It can feel sometimes like we have to walk on eggshells with God, the same way we would with other authority figures or bosses, or maybe your relationship with your parents can be like that way. Children are to be seen and not heard, or something. I think that's how the expression goes. It can feel like that's how it must be with God as well. And for me personally, when I was younger, this didn't feel very approachable or very appealing. If that's what God was going to be like, then why on earth would I want to speak to God? And as a result, we can become very apathetic, you know, and that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the worst way we could be. You can be hot or cold, but being, you know, lukewarm and apathetic of God, well, we end up doing nothing. We end up, you know, not even getting in the conversation in the first place. And when I talk to a lot of people, and myself included, actually, I would include myself in this, you know, it can, I get the very strong impression uh, that they feel like their faith is something they have to be really stressed about. It's a really uncertain thing. Um, it can feel like even your salvation is uncertain and your relationship with God is such an uncertain thing. You know, uh, am I doing the right thing always? Uh, 
is God mad at me? That's another one. Does God actually like me? Is that the case? Like we sometimes mirror, have really experienced this before. And, you know, I, the, um, I can't seem to please other people. Am I doing enough to please God? However, don't worry, guys, we're going somewhere with this. The more and more that I discover about God and his nature and his character, I realize that he probably doesn't want us to be so stressed about this kind of thing. Um, the amount of times in the Bible it says, don't be anxious, you know, don't fret, don't worry, don't be stressed. It would indicate that it's, um, that God thinks a bit differently. So if there's, before we get into the message, I hope, my hope for it is if there's one thing that you would take away from the message is that we would, we would start viewing God differently and stop viewing him as this kind of ruthless dictator who demands all these things of you. And instead, we shift the perspective uh, to viewing him as a benevolent king, a king who loves you, a king of our, our hearts, not someone who rules with an iron fist, but someone who's like a good father, who's like a good mentor. Or, yeah, to view him that way. So that's my hope for the message this morning. And, you know, we could talk about so many aspects of God's personality. We'd be here for months on end. Um, but the main one that I want to focus on this morning, one of his attributes uh, is grace. Let's focus on God's grace this morning. So God bless you. Um, definitions of grace. Uh, let's start by doing that. So what is grace? That's the title of the message. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines grace as unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. Unmerited meaning we've done nothing to, to merit it, nothing to uh, deserve it. That's another way of putting it. Divine assistance to humans. But the simplified version would be, grace is when someone does something for you that you could never deserve, earn, or repay. That sounds pretty cool. So, part one. Uh, what is grace? So we'll try and define what it is. Well, firstly, it is an attribute of God. These should maybe pop up on the, um, on the screen with scriptures. If not, don't panic. Uh, you can always write it down. Um, so firstly, it's an attribute of God. So God is gracious. It says in Psalm 145, 8, the Lord is gracious. So it's pretty straightforward. That's what he is. He is gracious. When God talks about his grace, He's giving himself. That's something that he is. It's something that he possesses, but he is grace as well. So when it says that God gives you his grace, he's giving you part of himself in the, in the deal. He doesn't just give you something. The gift is him. He has many attributes. He's love. He's, he's God. He's, but he is, he's grace. So firstly, that's what he is. Secondly, it comes through Jesus Christ. That's where grace comes from. John 117 it says for the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ Moses gave the law and Jesus gave us grace as a result of what he of what he did on the cross we'll go more into that later uh, Romans 515 says the gift came by the grace of one man Jesus Christ so without him it wouldn't be possible that's why he's the central figure of Christianity people get lost on that but the whole divide between us and God is bridged through Jesus. That's why he's so central. That's why he's so important in our relationship with God and understanding this, this thing. That is grace. Uh, point number three, it's eternal. So it's not just for a season. It's not just for a certain time of your life uh, when you're being good or whatever. It's eternal. It's a constant. So it says in 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us to a holy life. That's God. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace, nothing to do with us, but because of God's heart, because of God's nature, his grace, that's why he saved us. And this grace was given us in Jesus Christ before the beginning of time. Now, there's this uh, misconception that, you know, God of the Old Testament is very different to the God of the New Testament. His grace wasn't present then, but if you read uh, throughout the, whole, throughout the um, Old Testament and the New Testament, it was always there. There's a million examples we can look into, but we have enough time. But God always has been, always has had grace, and always will act in grace towards his people. That's very good, because we need it, okay? So God always will continue to be graceful. That's another part. Number four, it's free. Uh, it's unconditional, which means there's no conditions attached. There's nothing we can do or are able to do 
to attain this, to receive it. It's absolutely free. That's good news. You can, okay, it's a gift, so you can't earn it. You can never do enough work or service to try and obtain it, which is, which is good. For some of us, we feel maybe it's like, oh, we have to do something to attain this. We have to get our heads around that. Uh, for some of us, that's great news if we're lazy. But in Romans 3.24, it says, we are justified freely by his grace. Freely. It's absolutely free. And remember, justified means just as you or I had never sinned to begin with. And that's crazy. But again, uh, more on this later. It's as if we had never sinned. That's how he views us. Because of Jesus. Keep that in mind. Uh, it's a free gift. Titus 3.5. It's not by works or righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. This is a popular idea that, you know, if you're a good person, you do good things, you'll go to heaven, blah, 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 blah. But really, it's, it's already freely available. There's really nothing we have to do except believe. It's really as simple as that. Um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I'm just going to bash a lot of scriptures out and try and help them um, get to the point. So don't be alarmed, okay? You don't need to... Um, you don't have to be writing it all down. It's okay. We'll get, um, we'll get to a good conclusion. It says, um, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. It's something we need to keep bashing and getting into our own mind. It's nothing that we can, can do to attain this. There's nothing we have to do. There's no stress involved. It's already available. It's a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8-9. Number five, grace brings salvation. God brings salvation. Salvation became available for everyone, for everyone, through the death of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, it became a doorway to salvation for all who would believe. And that's the key point, who would believe, but it's available for everyone. Salvation is not obtained through works or any good deed. Uh, Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, even when we we didn't believe him we, even when we didn't follow him, which is the case today. It's still the same now. Even while we were still sinners, even when we do things wrong, Christ died for us now and for eternity. That's strong stuff, guys. Uh, point six, it's available for everyone. It doesn't matter about your, your background, about your circumstances, about your social standing, about who your family is, about what you may have done in the past, even the mess we might be in currently. It's available for everyone. God is available for everyone. He's grace and he's available for everyone. For now, today, in the future, it's always available. It doesn't matter if you mess up today after this. It's still available. Ephesians 4, 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's amazing gift. It's available to everyone. Now, this is the one which is helpful. We can't out -sin God's grace. Point number seven. Is it coming up? There it is. We can't out -sin God's grace. Now, this is incredible. So, largely, you know, we live in a, a, a culture where it's the case that we feel that we do something wrong and, and that's it. You've, you've kind of blown it at, at, as a result. We think, oh, I've done, I've done too much wrong. And that's how it can be with people. You know, you can, you can really outstay your welcome. If you do enough wrong, people are not going to want to speak to you again. People can, can cast you out. There's nothing that we can do wrong that's going to take us away from God. It says, you know, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. But this is something we really have to get our head around. It's so easy to just say, oh, you never leave me, you never forsake me, but not really believe it and not really act it out. More on, on what that will mean later. But we can never outsing God's grace. This is such a cool verse coming up here. It's Romans 5.20. Now the law came to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. There's not enough sin that can get past it. His grace abounds all the more. That's crazy. It doesn't matter what we do. His grace is more than enough, more than sufficient to cover that. Now we'll, we'll get onto more of the, the heart behind this later on, but this is a huge takeaway. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Literally in Greek, it says, where sin increased, God's grace super increased. You can't out -sin the grace of God. That's insane. So if I revert back to the, the intro, you know, this idea that God is this very stern, very stuffy person, you know, and if you make a mistake, that's it. That doesn't really sound like him. 
from what we can see in Scripture. Perhaps um, our perspectives can be wrong about God. And this is why it's so important to spend time in the Word, to spend time talking to God. <clears throat> Sorry. Opening our hearts to God, we can really discover His true character. But from reading the Bible just alone, it would suggest that, that He is just so much more than we could possibly imagine. So much more forgiving, so much more accepting. His grace super increases, even when our weaknesses are incredible. And it says um, in the Word somewhere, I've not written down the Scripture, we can go boldly towards His presence, go boldly towards His throne. It's not something we have to be afraid of approaching. We can really approach God. It's, it's not like we've done something or we are something that's too much for Him to handle. He's seen it all before. We can go boldly towards His throne. Part 8. God's grace is patient, and this is a cool one. For some of us, we're, we're slow learners and slow developers, and we can make the same mistakes continually. But God is patient. His grace is patient. He's patient. And there's a verse in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slow to fill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient. God is patient with you and I. He's patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. I mean, that's amazing in itself. You know, if there's people in our lives that we, that we would want to know God, it's, he wouldn't want anyone to perish. He loves everyone exactly the same. That's a wonderful thing to keep in mind, that we should all reach repentance, that we should all come to know him. That's a beautiful verse too. So that's um, a brief summation of what grace is. Okay, that's who God is. That's his nature. That's someone who's pretty approachable um, from, the, from the feel of it, okay? But there, there could be misconceptions about uh, what grace is, what he is. So part two is um, three misconceptions about grace. And it goes back to what we we're talking about. Part one is good works will make God love me more than he already loves me, okay? Uh, you can read the Bible for 12 hours a day, okay? You can serve on every single team. You can do every missions trip known to man. You can be a real good person. God won't love you any more than he already does. And that's not like a, a thing like, oh, don't serve, don't worry about it. But like the point is, it doesn't need to be done with stress. Like, we, you know, depending on who our role models or people were when we uh, grew up were, you know, you can feel like, oh, I can never do enough for this person to like me. It's not like that with God. You know, he already loves you as much as he could ever possibly love you, which is more than you can even imagine. You, you don't need to do any more for him to love you. For any more, um, you don't need to do any more works to attain his grace. You've already got it. This is really important. He, his love is unconditional. There are no conditions attached. There's nothing you have to do today or tomorrow or any day for him to love you any more than he currently does. It's unconditional, no conditions. Um, there's a great uh, quote. No idea who it's from because I've lost it. But it says, we do not read the Bible to change God's opinion of us. So in reading the Bible 12 hours a day, it's not to change his opinion of you and make him think you're great. But we read the Bible to change our opinion of God, to really understand who he is, to really understand his character. Because when we do, it changes everything on the inside. To find out who he really is, discover his true character, to realize how much he loves us, how much he loves you. And when it hits you, it's incredible. How much he cares for you and how much he wants to be a part of your everyday life. Uh, it says in Romans 11:6, <clears throat> And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Wow. Point two, another misconception about what grace is. It does not remove the natural consequences of my own actions here on earth. Now, this is important. Okay. So it doesn't mean that, you know, now we have this grace. We're free of consequence. The world is designed in a very specific way. There's always going to be a consequence, okay? If we're forgiven, it's cool, but there's always a result for the things that we do. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So, don't be stressed. You know, we're covered by God's grace. It's this amazing thing, okay? But we will still face the consequence of the things that we do wrong. Okay, sometimes we do things, they're not knowingly wrong. There's examples you know, where God will still cover us then. The, the consequence will, it won't be as we think. But we need to learn from these. Because if we're doing things knowingly, there's always going to be a consequence. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. 
I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. You know, there's this idea that God doesn't let us do things and he's spoiling all our fun. But really, you know, if you really look into these things, whatever it is, there's always a reason behind it why, why they're just not good for us, okay? You'll know it for yourself. Everyone has their own conviction of what they may do in their life that isn't good for them. And you'll know yourself why it isn't. It's, that's why he's instructing us not to do these things. But there's always going to be a consequence, okay? Uh, misconception number three. And this is the popular one with, with um, people who um, are just hearing about grace for the first time. Is that grace gives me a license to do whatever I want to do, okay? <laughs> also not true. Uh, in, the, in the Bible it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's the popular question that everybody asks. It's, oh, if you're forgiven, if you have grace, then why don't you just do whatever you like? God's already forgiven you for it. Um, and I guess this relates back to the second point. There's a consequence. It's going to affect you. Maybe it'll affect your mind, your body. It'll affect your relationships if we, if we do silly things. Um, but he instructs us not to do these things because they're not good for us, not to ruin our fun. But also, and I think the point to make is that if we actively choose to go back into sin, uh, that we haven't truly understood the gift that is grace. If we understand what it cost um, for this to be a thing, for Jesus to die, you know, imagine sending your own child to die for someone, and then they just take it willy-nilly, like, oh, well, you know, that's, that's great, and I'll just carry on with what I was doing before. It's, you know, we really need to respect what it is, and we can look into that in our own time, but understanding what, what it costs for this grace, it's unbelievable. It's it's insane. So when we actively choose to go back into it, we really haven't understood the gift that is grace. Because then if, if we do, we really don't want to go back into these, these things that maybe we did before in our past. Because when we learn to receive his grace, it's going to affect our hearts as well. And that's the thing. It's, it's not just head knowledge, but it really affects um, our soul and how, we, and how we perceive the world. Uh, and once we start working through this process, and the point that it is as a process, um, the desire for all things will fade away. I'm sure there's a verse on that somewhere. Um, and with that, uh, there's, I think it's very important to mention addiction here at this point as well, okay? Um, you know, we live in, in a world where addictions are a major problem, and it's not usually something that goes away overnight. You know, everyone faces it in one way or another. Um, it's not something that's so easy to leave at a moment's notice. The same applies as a process of allowing God's grace to affect us in those situations. Um, and, and to remind ourselves, you know, even in our weaknesses, even in our addictions, this is a, you know, it's a common thing. I think it's something we should talk more about, to be honest, but God's grace is still efficient in those times as well. You know, it's easy to condemn ourselves. Point is God won't condemn you, but we can condemn ourselves for the things that we still do wrong. It's, you know, it's okay, but God's grace is efficient, sufficient, even in our weaknesses and even in our addictions. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, this is really important. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, in our weaknesses as well. God's power is, is more than enough. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest in me. And I think the, the takeaway is, you know, we all sin and we all fall short. and We're all going to sin and fall short. And it says, any man who says he doesn't sin is a liar. Okay, so we don't want to be a liar. If we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us. Uh, again, in Romans 3, 23 to 24, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And justification means that God covers our sins. And when he looks at us, he, he doesn't see the sin anymore. He sees his perfect son. And when we really get a hold of us, then that really changes our heart and it really changes the way we, we interact in the world. So he didn't see our sin. There's a really great um, passage I just want to read quickly. It's John 8, and this is, uh, this is Jesus. It says, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in law commanded us, that such should be stoned. Now remember, there's a law, but then that was with Moses, but then when Jesus came, there was grace. But what do you say? Uh, 
this they said, testing him, that they may have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw at her the first stone. Basically, it means we all have, have sin in our own lives that we need to deal with ourselves. We can't judge others. And again, he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. And then when those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So I think the, the takeaway here is condemnation, it doesn't come from God. It says it in Romans, uh, now there's no condemnation for those in God. It's, it can be our own conscious sin or it can, be, you know, it can be something else. But that's something to remember. When we do sin, and this is important, we're going to make mistakes, okay? When you do sin, it's not a case of if but when, God doesn't condemn you for it, okay? It's not an encouragement to sin, but it's encouragement that, that his, those aren't his thoughts towards you. He doesn't condemn you. He doesn't give us a license to continue to do wrong, but it's encouragement that this sin isn't final, okay? So part three, how do we experience God's grace? It's very, um, it's very simple to, again, intellectualize it, to think, oh, well, you know, that's a great thing, but never really, never really grasp a hold of it. So how do we apply this, and how do we actively experience God's grace? It can seem like a nice thought, and maybe it's great to understand intellectually, but we want to experience it. So the firstly, experience his grace requires action, which would seem kind of counterproductive if it's something that we already have. But we need to learn how to accept this. And this comes through, through spending time with God, through really wrestling with this type of thing, wrestling with these, with these ideas that we already have this grace in our lives. It's not something we have to attain. It's not something we have to achieve or or do good works for. God, God has already bridged that gap. We need to learn how to accept it. It comes through prayer. It comes through reading his word. It comes through just letting it affect our hearts. Knowing that I can never deserve grace, it also requires action as well. It forces us to look at our actions and, and look at the heart behind why we're doing what we're doing. Is it you know, to try and attain grace, which we already have, or, or what's the heart behind it? Um, and we have to stop trying to earn it as well. This, this seems like, oh, you just do nothing, but it's a case of really shifting our focus away from always straining and always trying to attain this thing. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Allow this to affect you today, every day. Really get the understanding that it's, it's not something we've done. It's something that's been given to us. And when we understand the cost of this thing, it will affect you. You won't want to do the things that, that aren't right anymore. Um, point three, how to, how to get an understanding of it is taking the focus away from things out of your control. When we're really focused and concerned about, about things that we can control in our lives, it takes our thoughts away from the right things and, and puts them onto the wrong things. There's a whole mess we could do on that, but uh, we're not got the time. Three, pride. Pride hinders the grace of God in your life. Um, it says in James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So when we get full of pride and we think, I can do this all on my own, I don't need God's help, I can make it by myself. Personally, when I think that way, it's usually followed by a pretty big crash. So we, we can't do it by ourselves. We need God's grace, and that's how we're designed. We're designed for relationship with him. We require that relationship. We require his grace. And it's okay to, to accept that. It's, that's allowed. It's fine. It's okay to be weak because, it, like I said earlier in that verse, in our weaknesses, you know, that's where his strength really comes through. Something else to try and uh, grapple with in your own time. Then God's grace is, is frustrated when we have pride. Um, point four. We need to learn to rely on the grace of God instead of relying on our own works. Well, we've talked about that already. Now, part five of how to experience it is uh, being resentful versus practicing gratitude. It says in Hebrews 12:15, um, one of the things that limits God's grace in our life is bitterness. When we're, when we're 
bitter and we're, we're not focused on, on positives, I feel like I can really limit our, our seeing this grace, us experience God's grace in our life. When we get resentful, we allow bitterness to build up in our lives towards another person. It will hinder us experiencing. Now, it says, I, I've taken it from some other source. It says it hinders the grace. I don't think we can ever hinder his grace, but I think it can really hinder our experiencing of it. Uh, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Uh, some verse I've written down. But bitterness will hinder the grace of God in your life. He warns against it, so it's important not to become resentful. <clears throat> and one of the keys to not becoming resentful is learning to practice gratitude in everything that we do. Again, it's a process, and it's something that we really, uh, that I really need to work, in, work out in our own lives and learn how to practice gratitude daily in everything that we do. And it's an attitude that we can develop. And it's a perspective, and we need to learn how to turn this into a habit. Our scripture uh, that, that points out uh, a very good way of doing this is Philippians 4, 8 to 9. And it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, <clears throat> whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good of report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. So it's shifting our focus onto these things, which are within our control, and they're positives as well. This is what the Bible instructs us to do. It's not just, ah, think positively, but it's, it's an action. It's a direction that we go in. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So we receive peace through this. So, part four. How should we respond to the grace of God today? So instead of fighting it, you know, it can feel like we're not worthy um, and we're not good enough to, to have this grace. I've experienced this as well. It's still something uh, that's, that's hard to grapple with. We may feel like we, we don't deserve this grace. What we don't, quite frankly, is, is the takeaway. So don't worry because none of us are, are worthy of it. So instead of fighting that, accept this gift that he's given us. So we need to be able to respond to this grace. And he'll change us through it. It, it kind of seems... Um, it seems like you know doing one thing and and getting the opposite um, result from it, but that's you know it's the upside down kingdom. We don't deserve this grace, but the more we accept it, the more it's going to change us as well. And He fills us with His grace and calls us to extend that grace to others as well. It's not just something that we keep to ourselves, but that we share with other people too. Uh, it says in one Corinthians fifteen ten, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. <clears throat> so, why don't we just take a moment to uh, reflect this morning. You can close your eyes or, or do it however you want to do it. But yeah, I'd recommend that. <laughs> so, let's just reflect uh, this morning. And why don't you just take a moment to, to look at the areas in your own life where God's grace where you've seen it operate. Perhaps you can think of times or seasons where it was God's grace that covered you or when his grace was got you through a, a difficult time. You, know, can you perhaps think of a time where, where we were doing all the wrong types of things, but even still, God's grace was present. God's grace was super abundant. It was more than enough to get you through the season, more than enough to cover you, more than enough to get you back on the right track again. I can think of a thousand times in my life where that was present. And that's who God is. God is God is grace. God is love. God is not waiting for when you do something wrong with a stick to give you a good bash. God's hand is always extended. Even if we continue to do wrong, his grace is always available. And that's the incredible nature of God. And that's hopefully the God, um, the picture of God that we've been able to paint this morning. He's not a dictator who demands to, to rule your life, but he's a benevolent king, a king who wants to sit at the head of your life, not to rule over you, but to lead you into something, something even greater than that we're already in. Perhaps this morning, you still feel like you're not good enough to receive God's grace, not good enough to know God, or whether you've done too much wrong in your life, it's not the case. Perhaps you need a fresh perspective, a revelation of that this morning. It's very simple. Um, it's very simple. You just need to ask him. 
It's as simple as that. We can overcomplicate things in our mind. You can ask him this morning and you can experience that grace. So why don't we just pray together and then if it's the case that, you know, if you're watching on a live stream and you're here and you've not really experienced that before, you've not experienced God's love, you know, you can invite him into your heart this morning. So why don't we just pray together and then after which Benjamin's going to come up. So my encouragement is just relax. There's no stress on this, so let's pray. Now, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your love, Lord, for your mercy, for your incredible grace, uh, which is what you are, Lord, that you care so much about each person individually. You know, each of our stories, there's no moment that you missed. There's nothing that took you by surprise in any of our lives, Lord. Thank you for this incredible gift uh, that is your grace, Lord, that even when we slip and we fall, you're always there to pick us up, to encourage us and to, and to help us change, Lord, and to help us move on to something better. God, I pray for every heart here this morning, Lord, that, that we would be able to invite you in, Lord, that you would, um, you would help us be transformed by renewing our minds, Lord. Transform our hearts, Lord, to, um, to more like what you designed us to be, Father. I pray for those who feel condemned this morning, Lord. I just break that off in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray that um, people would experience you, Father. And Lord, that we would be able to really grasp a hold of what your grace is and what that means for all of us, Lord. That there's nothing that we can do to attain it, Lord, that really all we have to do is accept it and accept you into our hearts. And Father, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you this morning, Lord. Um, and if you're listening, if that's you, you know, why don't you just spend a moment with God to thank him for who he is, to, to invite him into your heart this morning. And we'll just uh, rest for a moment for you to do that. And so if you did you know, pray that prayer, if you didn't invite God into your heart this morning, it'd be my encouragement to, um, to speak to someone about it. To, um, if you're watching on a live stream, you can email us. Or if, uh, if you're here this morning, talk to somebody um, that's here in the building. I'll just pray for you guys quickly. And then um, I believe Benjamin's going to come up as well. Lord, thank you, God, for your grace. I pray we can really take a hold of this this morning throughout the week, Lord, that we can really get a hold of. There's nothing we have to do to attain it, Lord. All we have to do is accept you and, and um, allow you to do the works in our hearts. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.